Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and I just founded the Popper Party of Ontario. And our ethos is not only interest-free loans, but we want no cops in gambling, sex, or drugs, or rock and roll. We want no usury on loans. Pay cash or time, no dole. Well, dealing with the fight to legalize the good herb, marijuana, I've been involved in court cases too. And I've engineered seven appeals, all at the Ontario Court of Appeal, heard yesterday, November 7th, where I got the right to speak for the seven appellants and make their case, and the Crown really got beaten up badly, and there's a transcript coming. But this is the video of the interviews with the magnificent seven MedPod appellants at the Ontario Court of Appeal on November the 7th, 2011. Okay, I'm here at the Ontario Court of Appeal with Terry Parker. Five years ago, Canada Post intercepted a pound of his pot, and they won't give it back to him because he doesn't have an exemption. Now, we're saying that his doctor won't sign, and he shouldn't have to go out there and find one doctor in 100, then it was one doctor in 60, and now it's one doctor in 17. His doctor should have to participate in the global program, and that's the argument going on here. So he wants his marijuana back to be seized by the government. He's made a Section 24 application to get his marijuana back, and that's being heard finally here tonight. Now, back in 2001, 2002, a judge extended enough. In 2001, he got an exemption when he won the big case for everybody. It lasted a year. Well, a year, half a year later, Justice Pitt extended that protection until the government complied with the law to fix up an exemption that would work for Parker. Well, they've never fixed it for him since then, and we're saying that Pitt decision is still valid, even though in civil court they made a default judgment to get it set aside, and that was held up later on. We're saying it takes three Court of Appeal judges to overturn it, not one single civil judge to do that. And so that's another grounds of his protection. So that's Terry Parker's issue leading the charge today. And his most recent argument is the Beano, which is that the JP decision in 2003 said that the effect, and this is the Crown Attorney's words, the combined effect of Parker hits it, Parker said you need the exemption, Hitzig says it didn't work, was that there was no valid prohibition for the two years while the exemption wasn't working until they fixed it in Hitzig. Well, two months later they reinstalled the two limits on growers that had screwed up in the first place. Six years later the courts decided it was bad again, so we're saying how come no second bad exemption, no, uh, sorry, bad exemption, no offense, period. He was busted in the period while there was no exemption and therefore no offense. Wants his pot back. So, Crown's arguing they fixed it, laws back alive, but we'll see about that. This is the second front of attack. This is Gary Pallister, Mark McDonald, Deborah McIntyre. They are people who were charged. They now all have exemptions. And now Mark McDonald's charge was dropped, but Gary's and Deborah's, the Crown is continuing. Now all three filed motions to prohibit their charges, cite the Crown for contempt for busting them while the Crown knew the law was dead during the second Vino period, and actually on, and three expunge all the bogus convictions registered while the exemption wasn't working, like they did the last time when they dropped 4,000 charges in 2003. So what's neat is that the Crown is arguing they fixed the MMAR and that these people's appeals don't count because they were busted after. But what they made a mistake was Mark McDonald was busted before they fixed it. So he's a fascinating case because when the Crown says we fixed it, we can say, whoa, you made a mistake. They didn't fix it for Mark McDonald. And if they say, yeah, but we dropped the charges against Mark McDonald, we can then say, well, why didn't you drop the charges against everybody else busted in the second Vino period like Mark McDonald? And then we got him on the hook. So, the second front are people asking to have the Crown cited for contempt of court. And back in 2003, when they dropped the 4,000 remaining marijuana charges, there had been 100,000 people convicted during the two years the law was dead. And I asked them to expunge those charges, and they wouldn't. So they're asking the court today to erase those 100,000 bogus convictions from the bad two years between 2001 and 2003, and to erase the bogus convictions since 2003 December when they flawed the MMAR again, and everybody's convictions have been flawed since then. 
So they're asking to have all those bogus convictions fixed as once. Otherwise, we're going to come back at them with people appealing their convictions in the past one at a time, like Dean Grills and a few other we have on the agenda. So, this is front number two going on today. Front number three, let's get the two sick guys in here. Can you hear Sean Maloney and Wayne Hearn is on his way from the train station. His train should have arrived at 10, and we're going to simply bring him in after the show inside. So, Sean Maloney and Rob McCready are guys who were, are now exemptees, but who had been convicted because they didn't know about the Beano. And then they found out about it within the 30 days to file an appeal. They filed their appeals. They're saying that A, we could have tried to quash our charges. B, we could have tried to stay our charges with 26 flaws in the MMAR, including the one that was declared in Svetkopoulos and Barron and Myrna. And uh, finally, they could also argue that because of exemptees, they were sick at the time and they can establish medical need at the time of their busts. And that would have been their defense if they'd known. So they're raising all three fronts. Quash, because the law was dead and is still dead. Stay, because we want you to kill it. It should be dead. With 26 mistakes in the MMAR. And D, not guilty because they got established medical need. And the HITSIC 170 decision said that established medical need to simply be exempt. And in Quebec, in 2004, Johnny Dupree had his charges stayed when he brought his medical file and his doctor to court. And the judge said, okay, agreed. He established medical need. He's simply exempt. That's the first use of the HITSIC 170. So these boys, the medical guys, are raising all three arguments. Dino, Quash, Stay, and HITSIC 170. While the other guys are raising the contempt of court because the Crown knew about Bino and Expunge, and Terry Parker is here trying to get his pot back. So three guys in on one front, the sick front, with all three shots. Two, three guys in on the contempt of court and the Expunge, and then Terry Parker in on trying to get his pot back. Now we're going in, and the next time we turn on the camera is if the court says yes to our request to broadcast it live. Otherwise, I'm just going to turn on my tape recorder, go home, transcribe it, and post it. So either way, the story will be getting out of the charge of the Magnificent Seven, Medpot Magnificent Seven, Ontario Court of Appeal, November 7, 2011. Thanks a lot, boys. Let's get inside now and put up a fight. Well, the court were going to let us live stream the hearing. Justice Rosenberg, Sharp, and Juriens were presiding, and they pointed out that they'd already permitted televised hearings under an educational policy within the Court of Appeal structure. And, but it took the consent of the opposing parties, and the Crown just refused to give consent so that the court pointed out I could tape record the hearing as usual, but they're not going to be able to live stream it and turn on the camera. But they would have let us. Think about that. If we can ever get consent out of the Crown Attorney, or if the court finds a way to authorize it more officially. So, in the meantime, last interview. Recording. And last but not least, Wayne Hearn, who got here after taking a train down from Windsor. He's another guy who spent a lot of money on a lawyer who didn't do him any good. And then he found out about our system after he was convicted, filed his appeal on time, and got in to come and explain today how his difficulty with finding a doctor caused him all these troubles. And it was actually quite a great show. I can't wait to get home and transcribe the audio notes so that you'll be able to read what happened. The judges were going to let us play a live stream if we had the consent of the Crown Attorney, and he wouldn't consent. And that's why you didn't get to see what happened in court. So someday when they legalize my tape recorder for my notes, I'll be able to play it. But till then, I gotta go home and I gotta type it up so you can read it. So Wayne Hearn, the sixth guy on the Medpot Magnificent Seven charge at the Ontario Court of Appeal on November 7th. Justice Rosenberg, Sharp, and Julianz have reserved their decision which is great, means that they couldn't say no right away. Crown got beaten up pretty badly today. <laughs> they took a feel scratching. And uh, I can't wait to publish the transcripts. So that's it from uh, Toronto. Do a quick look around to our exemptees before we get out of here. Thank and you, thanks, John. Wayne. Thanks, John. My pleasure.
Thank you. So there we are, the Magnificent Seven. Bravo, it was a great show. Thank you. Well, I guess I may as well just read you my written report. I titled it, and it's been posted online, Charge of Medpot Magnificent Seven at Ontario Court of Appeal. We're not sure if a live stream worked right, but we tried doing interviews outside before going in, and I've made videos. It's here. You'll see it now. I also taped them on camera, and I'll upload that to YouTube later. Justice Rosenberg, who wrote the original of Parker decision, Sharp and Jury Ends were presiding, Crown James Gorham for Parker, and Kevin Wilson for Gary Pallister, Mark McDonald, Deborah McIntyre, Rob McCready, Wayne Hearn, and Sean Maloney. Issues raised, whether Parker should have sought extraordinary remedy of certiari, or were we right to use section 40 of the Ontario rules, technical, whether the hearing can be live streamed, whether John Termel can speak for the Magnificent Seven, whether Bino means the MMAR has been flawed, whether the MMAR should be declared flawed, whether HITSIG 170 applies, whether the Crown should be cited for contempt, whether the Crown should expunge bogus convictions, and whether Judge Clements and Gilmore should have barred the appellants from taping their proceedings. Now that's the only time Justice Rosenberg slapped me down. I'd taken a liberty and joked about how many judges didn't know about the 1980 time direction of justice, uh, practice direction from justice, uh, the Chief Justice, that we didn't even need to ask anymore. And yet we keep meeting judges who don't know. Don't they have a judge's school? Wham! Don't go there. But I did establish that we needed an answer once and for all about this. Uh, gee, yeah. Okay. But I did establish once and for all that we needed an answer about this tape recorder issue now. I even have another one coming up the pipes from refusal by J.P. Mullen during my own arrest case in Brantford for interviewing teenagers in public. Though stayed by the Crown, appeal of the tape refusal is still ongoing, even though he ordered free transcripts like Clement did for Parker. So the Crown objected to my speaking for the Magnificent Seven appellants, but Justice Rosenberg said he'd allow it. The Crown also objected to the hearing being live-streamed as point, and pointed out that the court had already, oh, as Section 36 only allows taping for personal notes. But then it was pointed out that the court had already tried televised hearings under the educational policy and could not apply here. Judge Rosenberg asked me how long it would take to set up. I said three to five minutes. Derek had the computer ready outside. But the Crown was adamant that it took the consent of both parties and ended up winning. So no live streamed hearing, but everyone in the room knew the court would have allowed it. So, I told the history and made their cases with the judge only having to tell me to tone down the volume once. By some fluke, there was a whole class of law students, probably from Osgood Law School, who'd come to watch the show. You know they could hear me, though I don't know if they could hear the crowns all that well who aren't speaking to the room. I stressed the reenactment of the two Hitzig struck flaws as stupid gimmies and explained how one grants stupid gimmies to a good opponent in chess who makes a boner move that costs him the game by letting him take it back to keep a good game going. I'm sure they'd understand stupid gimmies if they played chess. Now I think that paid off because the first thing Justice Rosenberg focused on when the Crown started his response, within first five minutes he asks, tell me something which I've never understood in all these cases was when this court struck down 41B and 54, why was the government's response to reenact them? And I said, these were stupid gimmies. Why would they do such a stupid thing? Well, the Crown, was, the Crown got to do their song and dance about the new policy of supplying marijuana covered them which later allowed me to joke how Svetkopoulos and Barron both ruled that supplying to non-growers had nothing to do with the limits they placed on growers. <laughs> Talk about gutting their cover story. So the Crown was ready for the Mark McDonald argument that he was busted in December 08 before the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Svetkopoulos April 09, unlike the other appellants who were charged after. But the Crown says they didn't obtain a stay of the Spetkopoulos decision from the Supreme Court of Canada of the Federal Court of Appeal decision, and therefore that decision 
took effect when they lost, not at the Supreme Court, but at the federal court earlier in 08. Now that's their argument, that because they didn't get a stay, the decision took effect earlier to fix the flaw. So Mark is still stuck now in the group of people who were charged after they fixed it. Now, they haven't yet dealt with, what about all the people just before they fixed it? What'd they do about them? So when you consider all the contortions to determine at what point the marijuana was fixed, you're left with the question of what happened to everyone else who was charged before. A stinking mess of a regime, I called it. It was quite a show punctuated by moving details of the appellant's sufferings under the MMAR. All had sought doctors for years. Rob McCready's exemption took six months to get, and he was busted at four months. And even his judge lamented how it's too bad they hadn't gotten his exemption quicker. I said it. Rob repeated it. What a problem they have, don't they? Can they really let his conviction stand when even his judge bemoans the MMAR delay? So Judge Rosenberg invited them all to speak. And when they thought of something to add and raised their hands, they got to complete their thoughts. I think everybody walked away satisfied at their treatment and their dice in the air. Uh, they reserved their decisions. So the funniest joke of all on the crown was this. Now remember how I've always argued that even though the first flaw, 41, had finally been fixed, the barren flaw, section 54, hadn't been fixed until 2010. So there was still no offense because they weren't both fixed at the same time. So the Crown then argued that Pallister had been charged after they'd fixed Spetkopoulos, but Barron didn't help him because the decision was still under suspension. And then the other appellants listed off one after another. Yes, yes, it was after the, we fixed the Spetkopoulos, but it was while the Barron decision was under suspension. Now, think about that. While he was pointing this out for the appellant after appellant, I was shaking my head with disbelief. Do you see what I see? Think about it for a minute. If they were charged while the Barron decision they are relying on was suspended, what does that mean? It means that the struck down, they struck down the bad sections, 41 and 54, hasn't taken place yet. The Barron decision didn't take effect yet during the suspension. So the flaws are still there. Now, he should be arguing that they are charged after Barron fixed it. By saying they are charged during the suspension, it actually is they're out. So I got to explain how the Crown had got it backward. That they're crowing that they were all busted during the suspension proves they were all busted before it had been fixed. Anyway, um, Crowns do this all the time. They play your card and say it gives them the pot. So Justice Rosenberg finally asked Sean Maloney to rise and pointed out that his bail ends on the date of his hearing. Bracket, he might even have had to give himself up to the Don jail the night before, like I had way back in 1978 for an inmate appeal. Maybe there was a warrant out. Anyway, bracket, Sean thought Cronk's, Justice Cronk's bail order lasted until November the 30th, but it lasts to the appeal, November 7th. Neat that he got in on the Magnificent Seven with just three weeks to spare. The judge also pointed out there seemed to be no sense appeal. So I jumped up, pleaded guilty to missing out on that, but I also pointed out how the Crown had specifically agreed before Justice Cronk to release him from his weekends in jail with a family 200, two hours away, and specifically agreed to release him because he had a shot at a sentence appeal. And could that be amended, please? Well, of course, that's what Judge Rosenberg did, and he's taking care of it. So at the end, just I saw Kevin Wilson was arranging for Sean's new bail papers, pending appeal, so it'll be the second time there's a no-money bail order out of the Ontario Court of Appeal that he'd ever seen that the old JP next door can say, wow, in 35 years I never saw a no-money bail order. That's a second. So there's tons more. It was a two-hour hearing. The appellant statements are priceless. All had the Murnov beef about not being able to find a doctor until they found about our network. And uh, it was truly compelling, but nothing more than Rosenberg pinning the crown on the stupid gimmies and giving me the chance to shoot down the, it helped the non-growers goose. I'll try to get the interview uploaded by this evening, maybe this morning. Bye.